Congratulations, you've just acquired a new Questar telescope, and I'm going to explain in this very quick start guide just how to get, get using it, get enjoying it, and uh, not uh, destroying or damaging it in the process. So we're just going to start from the beginning. I'm going to go through this very quickly, and we'll uh, likely do a much more detailed video in the future. So this is your quick start guide. First of all, these traditional cases are normally kept upright. The telescope um, resides in them vertically like this with its base resting here. This is an older version from the early 60s or late 50s and um, it has this flap in front that keeps the telescope from bulging out against the door. So that should always be in front of the telescope. It's all set up complete with an alternate eyepiece, some legs that can be installed in the base to give it an equatorial mounting. Where we've got a power cord to plug into the motor drive in the base, and, um, and yours may have a solar filter that screws onto the, onto the front. We generally avoid touching the polished surfaces too much any more than is necessary, so um, we just pull it out gradually. These two little plugs in front were um, oriented in the front so that we're they didn't rub on anything on the side. I should note that inside the case we have these, these buttons. That, that little disc holds down against the flange on the side here and that's what holds it in place. Most people don't know this, but um, those are actually have eccentric holes in them so that um, by loosening a screw on the side, you can rotate and adjust the gap between the bottom of the um, of the disc and the floor, and that can let you, for shipping, really grip the telescope in place. So if you were trying to pull your scope out of the case and it was really stubborn and stuck, and every time you're trying to push it back in, it's wedging tight, that's the problem, and you want to loosen that up. Or if it's wobbling around and not really holding it, you want to tighten it up. So the key controls to know about on the scope here, um, we'll just call this the right side over here, left side here. On this left arm is the declination brake. And that simply turns a about a half turn or three quarters of a turn from an unlocked position when you're turning to the right to a locked position turning to the left. This is counterintuitive and you're used to loosening to the left and tighten, tightening to the right. Um, this is different. So it's always going to be backwards and you can see on the interior surface here, there's a little screw head and that compresses against this declination disc, this declination ring. And so that locks it in place when it's locked, attempting to adjust the declination or, or uh, elevation um, won't do anything. And it's a good way to store it in your scope with the marker at 90. But with it unlocked, this knob adjust this angle. Now we'll take off our lens cap here. These are threaded tightly in place. This one is properly timed in the sense that the Questar logo is horizontal when it's when it's snug on the scope. It should be like that. If not, you probably had a, um, you've got the wrong cap or something like that. If you can remove the the logo, you can realign it, um, or if you get a new cap, they'll they'll ship it without the uh, logo attached, and then you can attach it yourself in the right orientation. These caps, by the way, uh, like to be dropped and dinged. They like to be set down on concrete surfaces and scratched up, and um, but we don't like that. So be careful with them. Uh, keep it in a pocket or leave it in the case. And frankly, if you want to get a uh, 95 millimeter uh, pinch cap from, uh, from eBay or a substitute cap, that's sometimes useful if you're going to be um, abusing your cap and you can save this so you don't have to spend close to $100 on a factory replacement. And incidentally, the factory replacement might not look the same and be appropriate for your era. So I'm going to lower the barrel to a horizontal direction as if we were putting it on a picnic table and doing terrestrial viewing of wildlife. And I'd like to demonstrate the difference between this is a slow motion action where the little, a little axle here engages this disc 
and provides very fine um, adjustment. That's one of the features of a, of a Quest Star. But sometimes you want to move it fast and you can do this and it slews. Uh, sometimes the knob will spin if it's engaged, which it is. Sometimes it doesn't spin. Even if we hold the knob, it'll still slew just fine. And either one of those is correct. The slewing also applies to the right ascension motion. I usually use my right hand on this knob. I'm sorry, my left hand on that knob and right hand on this one. So for right left or for um, right ascension motion in an equatorial mount, we use this knob. And similarly, we can do a slewing motion where the whole thing can be moved forcefully, but with just smooth resistance. Now let's orient you to the most confusing but useful feature of a Questar telescope, and that is the control box. This has uh, an array of knobs, all of which are important to the operation. The first thing I can see is that we may not be in a vertical orientation. These tubes can rotate. It might be stuck in yours, but they rotate smoothly. There's, a there's little screws on crescent-shaped black brakes, top and bottom, that adjust the tension on that and those are slot head screws that you can carefully operate. So normally we want this in a nice nice vertical orientation and if we want to get into great detail, the, the seam should properly line up at the midpoint here. Um, you may find other ways you want to align that. In the control box, we have at top center a two times two power Barlow magnifier. You don't have to know what that means, but except for the fact that there's a little lens in here that shifts between out of the optical path to in the optical path based on that. And that doubles the magnification of the telescope with a flip of a switch and a slight uh, focus adjustment. We'll worry about that later. Normally, you want that out of the path and this knob out to the side. The reason we, as a beginner, you want to start with this out of the way is because you can't operate the finder with that in the way. The finder only operates without the Barlow. That brings us to the finder knob, which goes from finder mode to telescope mode. And all that does is shift a a prism that essentially provides a mirrored surface right here in and out of position. So in the telescope position, the light from the telescope hits that prism or mirror and sends it up to the eyepiece. With the prism out of the way, the eyepiece looks down through a little lens here that's our finder lens and reflects the image off the mirror here, which is received on this axis here. So this is a low power, like a binocular power, Finder, and you can use it to center um, objects in the viewfinder. And then once you've centered the object in the viewfinder, here we are in finder mode, they're both out. Then you flip this switch and you'll be in telescope mode. This is our axial cap. It unscrews and gives us a view inside. You may never need to do this, um, but if you're interested to peek inside, and that gives you a view of that finder going in and out of position, which you might not be able to see in this lighting, but you'll be able to see on your own scope. You can also peek up inside there and see that Barlow lens going in and out of position. This is an older scope with a smaller diameter cap here, and uh, the newer scopes will have, a, will have a, a wider aperture. The purpose of this will typically be where you will attach a camera to be able to capture telescope images. The most important knob here is the focusing knob, and this one provides a very, very fine focusing effect that's actually moving the main mirror forward and aft over quite a range inside of the telescope tube. It turns more turns than you might realize. So if we have this all the way in, then we're focused past infinity. In, uh, in a typical Questar, you might need 
10 turns to get back to infinity. And I'm telling you all this because it's, uh, it can be a little bit of alarming when you have a new telescope and you can't get the darn thing to focus on anything. You may be working the 10 turns forward beyond infinity where nothing can be in focus, or you may be um, over the full range of 45 or 50 turns totally that lets you get very close up. So by my estimation in typical scopes, um, you're 12 turns back from the, from the fully in position to get to an infinite distance. A mere two turns more gets you as close as 100 feet to a backyard or across the street distance. A dozen more turns gets you to 20 feet or much closer. 20 more turns gets you from 20 to 10 feet. So this may be extended. It'll be a couple inches out from the back here and um, and you'll want to be careful with it after close-up viewing. Don't just slew it into position because it'll strike and scrape and damage the telescope. So return that knob to some reasonable distant viewing position. It doesn't need to be all the way in in order to do that. The main thing I would say about focusing is it's very, very normal to have that anxiety that you can't make it focus and there must be something wrong. So um, some of the, we'll talk about the troubleshooting, what if you can't see anything? It could be that your Barlow is in the wrong position. You're trying, you're looking through in finder mode, but the Barlow's in. This is the one mode you're not allowed to do because you'll never see anything in focus. Finder, Barlow in. So you want Barlow out for finder or telescope is happy with the Barlow in either position. Incidentally, with the Barlow, you're going to have less than a turn of adjustment to refocus the telescope from without the Barlow magnification. You'll see another little knob down here. This is for a solar filter finder that's very common on most scopes, but it's not on all scopes, especially the older one. And what that does is protect your eye from uh, bright sunlight, and it lets you look directly at the sun through the finder. You'll use that when you're also using the solar filter, which screws on just like a lens cap on the, on the uh, front aperture of the telescope. And for troubleshooting, if you just can't see anything through the finder, this is basically a lens cap in every condition and except looking at the sun. It only lets through like one part in 10,000 of the solar light. So, um, so you'll want to flip that. So it's flapped down to the side in order to have normal viewing for um, astronomical objects and normal daytime objects except the sun. And for the sun, you flip that up. If your scope does not have a finder filter, but does have a solar filter, you should consider it essentially unsafe and incomplete, and you do want to obtain a, a finder filter, or at very least put a warning label on your solar filter so that anyone who might attempt to use it and look at the sun doesn't end up in a situation where um, they're safely observing the sun through the telescope and inadvertently flip this and get a searing retina burning uh, binocular view of the sun unexpectedly in their eye. Let's talk about using the finder. This is an older model and it has a, um, an eyepiece that focuses by rotating it. Newer models will be very, very similar, but it will have the, uh, the, the collar that supports the eyepiece will do the focusing. And all you need to do to get a nice sharp view through the, through the finder with the lever set like this is simply adjust your eyepiece until you're happy. Uh, you'll normally focus it for infinite astronomical objects, but you can set it however you wish. The eyepieces will unscrew so you can remove and change to a different magnification. And newer eyepieces will have a slightly different operation, but the principles are the same. The only difference is these older eyepieces will have the focusing mechanisms in the eyepiece, whereas the newer setup um, that you'll see since the 60s and, and 70s and newer will have the focusing in the uh, eyepiece holder right here. Now we'll give you a little demonstration on how the legs can be set up for equatorial operation. First we remove these plugs and for your curiosity the plugs can screw into the holes 
like this when they're both screwed in all the way. Imagine hanging your telescope over a car window like that. That was in the early catalogs that demonstrated that feature here. Um, it is probably not as sensible for modern curved car glass as opposed to the thick flat windows of old cars from the 60s, um, but it's a fun way to test your faith in the strength of auto glass. These plugs have a are made differently currently, so these are irreplaceable if they look like this with the screws on them. Um, you don't want to lose them, you don't want to um, let them get scratched up, so treat those with care. And so on these older scopes, we have these finely ground legs that slide right in with a very, very nice snug fit. And the newer ones, they are threaded in, which is much more practical for manufacturing, uh, less precision required. And then we have the central leg here that uh, inserts in the base. So now we have this set up for, um, for your latitude. You can adjust the, the length of the center leg to do that. And for instance, we can set by lining up the center mark here with the number that corresponds to your latitude. I'm gonna set this for 33. We adjust the leg until we extend that until we're happy with the a level orientation at the top and now we're in equatorial. We can do the same thing, by the way, if we're mounting this on a tripod, where all you need to do is have the tripod base um, mounting against the telescope base, and the tripod screw um, goes up into the screw in the center of the base, just as, you were, as if you were mounting a camera. And that is everything you need to use the telescope uh, let's talk troubleshooting one more time. If all you see is blackness, then check your front lens cap, make sure it's removed. Check your finder solar filter to make sure that it's uh, flipped down and aside so it's not blocking your view. And that's probably gonna solve your problem. If you are indoors in the evening and um, looking at close-up images of things across the room, you may be surprised at how dark it is. And so you want to make sure anything you're looking at has uh, very strong illumination to, to really show it up um, through the, the um, relatively narrow aperture of this scope. If all you see is blurry, first thing is, if you're in finder mode with both levers out, adjust your eyepiece. If it's blurry in finder mode and you can't make the finder focus, you are undoubtedly uh, in the Barlow mode with this lever up and that needs to be aside. Let me add also, if I say flick the lever and flip the lever, it's very tempting to, to give a very ab abrupt or, or quick motion on that. On these telescopes, I've seen enough about the inside of them when they're 50, 60 years old there's no mechanism that can withstand uh, thousands and thousands of flips and flicks and still be uh, lightweight and precision. So um, a, a careful and deliberate turn every time is going to be a good habit that makes your scope last a long time. If you have a blurry image, the other thing is you just got to run this focus all the way in. If you have a good understanding of about what to expect for focus, all the way in, you're not gonna see anything. Take it out 10 to 12 turns, you're gonna be focused at, at uh, distance and astronomical objects. And then a couple of turns gets you into neighborhood distances. Uh, a dozen more turns gets you into backyard distances and a dozen more gets you into across the room distances. So unless you're looking very close up, 
you're not going to be working the the extended close-up range of the focus. It's all going to be in the um, in the forward portion there. You'll start to get used to the idea of just being able to look at this, and I can see that that's probably about 10 turns worth here, and um, I'm going to be close to the range, and I know that if I'm going to get out, look out the window, it's not going to be too many turns out here before I start seeing the branches and birds' nests in focus. Incidentally, this is an older scope that has an unusual focus knob. Yours is probably going to be a little, a little smaller without this flange at the forward end, but they all work the same. After you've had a, um, a viewing session, especially at night when it's cool out and you're bringing the telescope into a, a warmer location, you will find that there can be condensation on the scope just as your glasses might fog up or a, or a cold drink might fog up. And the most important thing is don't put the telescope away when it's in that condition. Leave it out, let it air dry, let it come up to temperature naturally. If you put it away, all the moisture is going to stay inside the case and you're going to risk damaging uh, corrosion, you're damaging the case and, uh, and uh, harming the telescope. And as far as maintenance, you can simply use a soft cloth on the polished surfaces here. Leaving sweaty, acidic fingerprints is probably not an ideal thing for what is bare aluminum have a good habit of wiping off the fingerprints and if you can put it away using um, contact with the, the painted surfaces in here that's another good way to do that. Let me add one more topic about how not to damage your Questar telescope and that has to do with cleaning the optical surfaces. First of all inside this, if I take the break off, inside this we have some spectacularly beautiful reflective surfaces in there. That's all sealed up and you're not going to want to touch that. If you should happen to shine a, uh, a bright flashlight in there, you may start to see some worrisome little smears and dust specks and things like that. That's normal. My advice is don't do that and it won't bother you. But when you look under normal light, you're just going to say, wow, that's just bright and shiny and gorgeous. If you start to see um, you know, sparkly aluminum foil looking patterns at the edge of the mirror or yellowing or something like that, you may have a, a need for service or recoding or something and that's something you want to talk to the factory about or go online or see some of my videos on how I've, how I've handled some of those. But leave it alone is the first rule. For the front surface here, this is the most valuable exposed surface and you really don't want to do anything to it. The one thing you're allowed to do is with some kind of a blower you can squirt air on it or compressed air um, and when I say compressed air meaning the aerosol can kind not in your garage and blow dust off of it. If Even if you had a little fingerprint smudge you're probably better off leaving it alone once you start trying to clean this, sometimes you're, you're, you're going to make it worse and you're not going to be happy. And the more you clean it, the more you're going to tend to scratch any microscopic dust into the surface. And that can never be, um, never be cleaned, those kind of scratches you can generate. So don't clean it, leave it alone, and um, on, especially on this surface. Other surfaces include the eyepiece at the top where your eyelash oils and, and pocket lint can get on there, you might be a little bit uh, more willing to use a, a Q-tip or a, a Q-tip wrapped in a, uh, a photo, I use PEC pad, P-E-C-P-A-D, and, um, and some uh, photo cleaning solution that's going to be based on methanol probably. There's a little mirror down below, that's the finder mirror, and that will get dust on it. First of all, it's only the finder, so don't fuss too much about that looking a little dusty. If you needed to, again, the same way you'd clean a camera lens, um, you can take care of that. It's not your primary optical surface, so you're not as uh, endangering the value of your telescope if you clean that a little too often, but there's really no reason to. And then also, up underneath there, you'll be able to see the finder lens, 
and that could be dirty too. For instance, if you acquired a scope that was stored in very dirty conditions, you might really need to clean those things. And uh, maybe you can watch some of my, my repair videos on how to access those things. But otherwise, you should be just fine. There will be a temptation someday when you want to see how that Barlow works and you will unscrew the eyepiece holder to look inside the control box. And you, when you're peeking at the Barlow, you may find it has a little smudge on it. You'll get tempted on that. Again, try and leave it alone, but if you have to, use sensible uh, photo quality products for it. One more thing when storing the scope in the case, this is not the correct way to do it. If you have to angle the, uh, the scope like this to get the door to close, that's where the eyepiece should just rub against it. You probably have the wrong eyepiece in. The eyepieces are different length based on magnification. We have the, the longer, lower power eyepiece that's too big for the, for the situation, and so that wants to go in the door pocket, and we can put the smaller, higher powered eyepiece in place. That's it. That's it. Close it up and fit without any problems. And so that's about everything about enjoying your Questar telescope. It'll, it's always a little bit nervous at first with such a fine instrument as this, but they're very sturdy, robust, and they will serve you very, very well. So I hope you enjoy it, and let me know if you have any questions about how to take advantage of your Questar telescope.